hearing. Um, I want to ask a question about the way to support diverse healthcare providers in innovative models that we are kind of rolling out, value-based models. Um, and um, let me talk about a primary care physician who practices in Richmond named uh, Lurla Joseph. I've known Dr. Joseph since I was on city council and mayor. She's an African-American woman. She serves predominantly African-American community in Richmond, Virginia. Her patients are more likely to be uninsured or underinsured, and they're more likely to have multiple chronic conditions that require significantly complex management. When the ACA was passed, Dr. Joseph saw the growth of value-based care movement as an opportunity to look for new ways to provide care for her patients. And since then, she has successfully participated in accountable care models, resulting both in cost savings, but also improved patient outcomes. But as part of this journey, she's realized that we, the, as Congress, but also the CMMI, um, could be doing more to support diverse providers, rural providers, small providers. Um, as she says, equality is one thing, but equity is another. She, she believes a lot of the focus on building these value-based care models have focused on larger providers and not necessarily those serving rural or minority communities. Um, not every provider is starting from the same starting point. Some need more support than others to make the transition of value-based care. And um, it seems obvious to me that we, could, that we could do more to support diverse providers, and we should. So perhaps I'll just start with you, uh, Dr. Navathay. What more can Congress and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation do to support diverse providers serving their communities when it comes to these value-based care innovations? Thank you, Senator, for this very important question. So I, I think just taking one quick step into the root cause might help understand. So when CMMI typically tests a model, it tests in a voluntary framework where providers have to raise their hand and say, I want to mm -hmm. join. Perhaps it's not surprising then that well-resourced providers who can bear risk and can in make investments end up joining. And so we don't get a representative population. We then look at the results and the practice innovations for, the, for those models and we try to scale them. Uh, and that doesn't always work for diverse populations. So I, I think as we think about what CMMI and, and others can do to help kind of boils down to maybe three things. You know, one, we need models that are really truly directed towards safety net providers, toward rural providers, uh, toward providers that take care of diverse populations. Uh, so there's increased investment and technical support for them. Uh, secondly, when we do voluntary models, we have to check for representativeness. We have to make sure that we're actually getting participation from those or create better incentives for that to happen. Uh, and third, rethink this paradigm of voluntary to mandatory. You know, this idea that we're just going to let whoever raises their hand and then scale what happens. We might have to rethink that to begin with. Can, can I, and Mr. Chairman, I get on a soapbox here that I wasn't intending to get on, but based on Dr. Navathay's answer, this equality versus equity thing. Some, some people seem to be really worried about the, the word equity. Um, and yet, you've just given a perfect example. Uh, participation in a program, first come, first serve, raise your hand. That is as equal as can be. But it's not going to produce the right health outcome. It's not. When we started to finally deploy vaccines that were developed in COVID, we said, anybody over 65 can get them. That's as equal as can be. But what we found after about three months of that was some people over 65 really know how to use a computer. And in my neighborhood, they were searching, Walgreens has it today, but next. And then it's the CVS across town. Those who had the computer and the time to use it, they were getting vaccines. And those who didn't have the computer or didn't have the time to use it or had a day job, even they were over 65 and didn't have the time to spend they were not getting vaccinated. And then 90 days into the vaccination rollout, the communities that were getting hit hardest with COVID were being under vaccinated compared to others. Now, 60, everyone is eligible if you're age 65. That is an equality policy. There's nothing unequal about that. But it was producing an inequitable result that was actually hurting the health outcomes of the people who are most affected by COVID. So we actually learned as we're then in the deployment of vaccines and we switched to models where we're going to do vaccine clinics in public housing communities. We're going to do vaccine clinics in rural places where folks might not have the CVS so close to them as somebody else does. And then over time, 
the, the vaccination rate started to sort of more equalize among the population. But to do that, we had to be intentional about it. And, and I, in the health space, I can think of about 50 examples of this where the, the policy that is an equality policy is not going to produce an equitable result. But maybe more importantly, it's not going to produce the result that's right in terms of the health outcomes that we're seeking. And so I really appreciate you sharing that answer. And Mr. Chair, I'll yield back to you. 